Welcome to P. Clark Calc, Practical Calculus for the Busy Math Student. And here we're going to take a look at a specific uh, application from business calculus that requires the use of the derivative. It's called elasticity of demand. And in this video, we're looking at it as a function of the unit price. Here we're looking at a specific business calculus application known as elasticity of demand. And what it measures is, is how much does the demand react to a change in price. I mean, we know no matter what happens that our demand will drop as the price goes up. So for instance here in our example we're looking at a demand function of 100 minus p squared. So in this case we're looking at demand as a function of price. So this would be units sold. We often label that x but here in this definition that's d. And so if it's 100 minus p squared then we, we know it's going to look something like this. So we're looking at this inverse relationship between price and demand, and it's just a matter of how fast or slow is it is it changing, and that's what elasticity of demand is trying to measure. Um, so if we if we go back to its definition, the formula here, and what you need to know, is the formula that elasticity as a function of price is defined as negative p times d prime of p, the derivative of that demand function, divided by the demand function. And where that comes from is the definition of elasticity as the ratio of the relative rate of change of demand, which is defined as the derivative of demand over demand. We take that relative rate of change and we put in a ratio to the relative rate of change of price. So the derivative of p with respect to p is 1, and then that's divided by p. So if we, if we multiply by the reciprocal, then we have p times d prime p over d of p, which if you look at that and compare it to our formula is off by a minus 1. Now the negative sign is just a convention that was introduced by the economists because we, we know that this relationship, whatever this, whatever this rate of change is, we know it's going to be negative. And so when they discuss elasticity, they don't like to have a minus sign in front of it. So to give it a positive value, they just multiply the whole thing by negative 1. So that's where the formula comes from. Um, ultimately, what we need to be able to do is to calculate its value for a given point in the, in the market and then to evaluate what that means. So, so here's a, a simple example with polynomial functions. So if we go ahead and do the calculus, the calculus is just the derivative of, of d. So we do d prime of p, which in this case is just a power rule, negative 2 times p. And then we just have to remember our definition. So elasticity for this scenario is a function of price. It's going to be negative p times the derivative of d. So that's going to be negative 2p, all divided by d of p, 100 minus p squared. So when we simplify it, we end up with 2p squared divided by 100 minus p squared. So we get this function of p, and then we had just evaluate it at a certain point in the, in the market. So here we're being told that we're, we're working at a market price of $5. So elasticity of our product at 5 2 times 5 squared divided by 100 minus 5 squared. So that gives us 50 over 75, which reduces to 2 thirds. So elastic, again, what, what does this number mean? This is the relative rate of change of the demand to the price. So this means that the, the demand is changing at a rate two-thirds as fast as the price, or it's reacting less than the price change. And when that occurs, when the value of E is less than 1, we call that an inelastic demand. And so the result of an inelastic point in the market is that if you raise the price of the item, you're actually going to raise revenue. Behind all of this and all these conclusions that we make about elasticity is that the definition of revenue is equal to 
is equal to x times p, or it's equal to the demand times p if, in this case with our with our d label. So in this case, if I would if I would raise my price, I'm not going to lose as much demand. I'm only going to lose two thirds of the demand. So let's say I raise my price three percent. I'm only going to lose two percent of my demand in the market at that point. So overall, my revenue is going to go up. So if the goal is to raise revenue, if I have something that's inelastic, that would be that would be the time to raise the price. So that's how we interpret that ultimately. Um, your other cases are elastic demand and elastic demand occurs when the elasticity value is greater than one. That means that demand is reacting more than the price change. So let's say you have an elasticity of three, that means a one percent a one percent price cut would result in a three percent uh, increase in demand. Again, they're always moving opposite directions. That's just the nature of demand. So the conclusion, if you are at a point in the market that is elastic, then what you would want to do is lower your price in order to, to raise revenue. Um, and then there's the case of every now and again, if the elasticity is exactly one, that means that whatever change I make in the price of the product, I'm going to have an exactly equal relative change in the demand in the opposite direction, which means that the revenue would be unchanged, which means I'm actually at the point of maximum revenue. So kind of a side effect or a secondary use of elasticity is you can use it to actually maximize revenue uh, if you wish, rather than the direct route of taking the marginal revenue and setting it equal to zero. So just to kind of wrap up our thought here. Let's let's just look at another scenario. If it was the same function, but our market price was at eight dollars, let's say, then the elasticity at eight would be two times eight squared divided by a hundred minus eight squared. And so there we see we have an elasticity of 128 divided by 36, which is 3.5 repeating, but it's definitely it's definitely greater than 1. So that would be a, an example of an elastic market. So so it's saying that the optimal price here somewhere is between 5 and $8, right? If the $5 said it was inelastic, I should raise the price to raise revenue. The $8 said, well, that my elasticity was, was elastic, and so I should lower the price. So the way that we can go ahead then and define the, the optimal point using elasticity is to actually set the elasticity equal to 1, and then go ahead and solve in that case. So, so my maximum revenue is the solution to this equation. Maximum revenue point, I should say. So if we can go ahead and solve that, that's going to give us our optimal market price. So let's just clean a little space here, and then we'll go ahead and do that. So we cross multiply there. We end up with 100 minus p squared equals 2p squared. Three p squared is equal to 100. So p squared is 100 over 3. So my market price to, to maximize revenue here using the elasticity function would be the square root of that. So 10 over the square root of 3. And at that point, we would like to have a, a decimal value for that. So that's about $5.77. And if you put that back in our other two examples, we saw that at five dollars, we did need to raise the price, but we were we weren't very inelastic. We we're getting close to one, whereas at eight dollars, we were pretty high if we were trying to maximize revenue. So that seems like a good solution for us. And so that's it's a very specific application, very interesting one when you get into it. And you know what products have inelastic demand? You know, inelastic demand would involve things like um, a lot of commodities, gasoline, oil those sorts of things, natural gas. Inelastic demand would be things like furniture and jewelry and if things that go on sale a lot, you know, tend to be elastic demand. Things that tend to get taxed a lot tend to be the inelastic demand, things that people want or need very badly. So so kind of an interesting application there. Um, ultimately you do need to know the formula, be able to use it, and know how to interpret the results at some given market price.
If you'd like to learn more about applications as a derivatives or calculus in general, you can find them on my textbooks, which are available on Amazon for a really nice price. So until next time, I'm P. Clark.